Hi everyone, I'm Megan Sperling. I'm the manager of SharpFest Health and I am so excited today to host this webinar, co-host this webinar I should say, with the wonderful Joe Cole, um, who is the coordinator for emergency preparedness at Sharp Healthcare. Hi Joe, how are you? I'm fine, Megan. How are you doing today? I am doing really well. And I'm so glad that you have a couple of minutes to spend with us today. I'm so excited to hear from you about Sharp Healthcare's Emergency Disaster Preparedness Plans. Uh, maybe talk through a little bit about disaster preparedness more globally. I understand that you have a really sort of wide berth of knowledge and I, I kind of wanted to start off um, First, by asking, you were sharing with me before we started recording a little bit about your background and uh, you know what you've done in this realm. And I was wondering if you would share for the people that watch this webinar a little bit about um, what you've been doing in your time at Sharp Healthcare. Um, absolutely. Um, hi everyone, my name is Joe Cole. I have been at Sharp Healthcare for 31 years now. Um, the last year I have been in disaster preparedness working with my director, Sharon Carlson. And um, previous to being um, the disaster coordinator, I worked over at System Supply Chain Services as a contracts analyst and a, um, uh, God, I got stuck. <laughs> <Yeah. A contract. laughs> well, you said you've been here for 31 years, right? So I guess with 31 years, you're gonna have a couple of different hats you're wearing. Yeah, a couple of different hats. Oh, God, I can't believe Were it. you a medical, but, medical assistant too? I was also a medical assistant for 15 years. Um, I worked in SICU, MICU, and CCU, and I also ordered supplies for um, those areas, which is how I got into um, system supply chain services. I was also in the Navy for seven years. Um, I was a corpsman, um, and I have had um, some combat experience also. Um, aside from what I do at Sharp Healthcare, I am also um, a member of DMAT, which is Disaster Medical Assistance Team. And uh, I, along with a, a group of doctors and nurses, whenever there's a um, some sort of a catastrophic event, unfortunately, uh, in the country or around the world, um, our team will go out and will help out um, if um, hospitals have been knocked out. Um, if people can't get any medical care, we'll set up a um, tents and uh, hospital settings so that we can help get them taken care of. Um, I'm also on CalMAT um, for the last two years, um, which helps out a lot with the CAL fires um, that we currently have going on. And that's also any disasters that happen in the state of California, um, my team will get activated and uh, we'll, we'll go out and we'll assist in those communities. And I'm also the trainer for those teams. Wow, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, to, to those who are, are watching this, they may not realize you were just congratulating me on my 10 years of experience at Sharp Healthcare. I just had my 10 year anniversary. And then you mentioned that you had done 31 years. And so when you when you capture all the things that you've been doing uh, within Sharp, but also for the broader community, it's really, really incredible how much knowledge and expertise that you're able to bring to this topic. And again, that's why I'm so grateful that um, you were willing to spend this time with us recording this webinar and to share and educate um, with our team members a little bit more about disaster preparedness and you know I think Joe right now we're we're kind of dealing with multiple disasters multiple emergencies in our state in particular but really across the country and I know that you're um, I think a lot of people have really become very familiar with the, their name, with your name, if they hadn't been already, um, given all of your work uh, to uh, support uh, um, our efforts on COVID-19. And so I, I do just want to say thank you for everything you've been doing for Sharp Healthcare, um, really over the past 31 years, but in particular for the past year. It's been um, incredible to see how much, uh, um, how ready and how prepared Sharp was thanks to your efforts and Sharon's efforts. So thank you so much for everything that you have done and will continue to do. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled, <laughs> really. Thank you. I, re I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And then so again, I, I kind of, um, I don't want to delay our conversation. I, I know you have a lot of really wonderful content to share with Sharp employees who watch this. So for those who are watching, um, just so you know how this will work is Joe's really going to kind of walk us through a lot of incredible information around emergency disaster preparedness. Uh, Joe knows that I will be sort of the, um, the uh, slide deck manager. So Joe, just let me know when you want me to advance slides. And 
uh, we'll ask questions along the way, um, hopefully capturing some of the questions that people who are watching this may have. But Joe, it's up to you now. Go ahead and feel free to take it from here if you'd like. Okay, well, um, we can move on to the next slide. We have the okay. contact information up there if you want to get in contact with us at, um, for disaster preparedness, I said, along with my director, Sharon Carlson. Um, the contact information is on the board. You can contact us anytime you want to. Um, so uh, the first thing we need to ask ourselves is what is a disaster? Okay, so a disaster is a serious disruption occurring over a short or long period of time that causes widespread human, material, economic, or environmental loss, which exceeds the ability of the affected community or society to cope using its own resources. Um, so looking ahead, um, if you would, you can think of, um, can you name some disasters? And, and I'll ask Megan, can you, can you name some disasters? No, I can't think of any. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, there are so many. I mean, I think the ones that come to mind right now, and this is kind of an easy one, but when I think about all of the wildfires that are happening across our state, and it really across the whole West Coast, I mean, that is certainly a disaster and um, certainly an emergency. Uh, absolutely. And um, if, you, if you go to the next slide, um, the way we look at disasters is we look at them in, in two ways. Um, so there's um, anticipated disasters and, and there's unanticipated disasters. So um, how would we describe an anticipated disaster? If you look at the uh, um, slide deck, you'll see that in 2007, Minneapolis, a, a bridge collapsed in Minneapolis. Well, why was that anticipated? Because if you remember that event, um, for about actually 15 to 20 years, um, the city council was told that they need to work on this bridge because the infrastructure um, in that community was falling apart. Um, take any action, and unfortunately, um, during rush hour, the, the bridge collapsed. Um, uh, 13 people died from that event, and you had over 41 people that had to get transported to the hospital. Um, 2008. Um, uh, Cyclone RG, which is in um, the province of Myanmar. Um, in this particular event, it's a Cat 5 cyclone that hit shore and um, 54,000 people came up missing and also 38,000 people lost their lives. And so um, part of the reason was because the government wouldn't put up any early warning systems. Um, so they had, um, they're, they're also a city that was built below sea level. And so when you put those two things together, you know, um, you, you're looking at a catastrophic event. Um, 2017, Hurricane Maria, um, uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And we know from um, that event to, to this day, we're probably looking at $100 billion worth of damage, at least. And, and, and um, here we are in 2020, and they're still recovering from those things. So we, we say those were anticipated because in, in, you, know, you know that these events are gonna happen and you have to do things to try to mitigate um, some of those things if you can. And if you have um, powers that be that don't want to move forward with some of these measures, um, this is possibly what could happen. Um, now, unanticipated. And just so we're, we're, it's not always mother nature, it's not always, you know, um, this or that, it's technical, it's mother nature, it's human errors, uh, these mm -hmm. things can happen. Um, the reason why Yahoo is up there in 2016, from 2014 to 2016, um, Yahoo had the uh, biggest data breach ever. Um, Three billion users had their um, information compromised, and that's usernames, passwords, social security numbers, um, credit card numbers. Um, it, it was a, a huge data breach. Um, so we have to be mindful of those things when we're going online. Um, 2019, COVID. I mean, this started, we don't know the exact date that it started because there's so much um, information out there. Um, but we do know it started late last year in 2019. And um, right now, the United States is heading towards about 200,000 deaths. Um, 2020, um, I just updated this, <laughs> um, the California wildfires, we are now over 2 million acres burned wow. and um, it, it, there's really no end in sight at the, at the moment. So um, this, uh, right, this event right now is the largest fires in, in California history. Um, 
San Diego, um, um, to, 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 to the point, um, San Diego, um, for those of us that live here and we're comfortable and we look and we see all these fires are, are happening at the north of us, um, keep in mind, San Diego has had some of the largest wildfires in California history. Um, 2003, 280,000, um, over 280,000 acres burned. Um, 2007, over 1,600 buildings destroyed. 2014, uh, 26,000 acres and 65 structures were burned. In 2016, um, the board of fire, 7,609 acres burned. Um, I would encourage anyone um, that is living in San Diego and from what you're seeing uh, across the United States of America right now, um, watch this video called Fire in Paradise. It's on Netflix. Um, it goes through the events of what happened in 2018 in a, a, a town called Paradise. And it, it gives you a firsthand in-depth um, uh, sightfulness of what actually went on. I mean, they have cameras in the midst of a fire where people were actually trapped and they couldn't go anywhere. They had to hunker down. Um, how it started the first thing in the morning and, and, and the amount of time that it took. And I say the amount of time in the sense that, you know, all the different things that happened, but this was a very fast moving fire. Uh, and, and a lot of people did not have the opportunity to get to get out of town. And so um, later on in the slide, when we give you ideas about being prepared, um, think back to these are lessons learned from people that have actually been in these um, situations. And if you're looking at the news right now, and if you're looking at um, what's going on, you you understand that people are losing everything. They have no opportunities to, yeah. to get back to their houses. They don't have um, things put in place um, because they didn't anticipate that this may happen in their community. You know, that makes me think of that, yeah, that quote that says, you know, if you're looking for a sign, this is it. It's like, as we think about all the things that are happening right now, this is your sign that there is wisdom and a really, really good reason to prepare. Don't wait for you to be the person that gets profiled on Netflix because there's a fire in your area. This is everyone's sign that we need to start taking preparation seriously. Absolutely, absolutely. I've never heard of that documentary. And I'm really glad um, that you've shared it. I have researched before a little bit about what happened in paradise and it was devastating um and the fact that we're right now in a current state of devastation happening across the west coast just shows you how common this is all becoming um, yeah. so thank you for that feedback oh you're quite welcome now what, what are we looking at here <laughs> yeah guess what else we got in san diego what else do we have joe <laughs> you know um, we, we, we also live on a fault line. Um, now, most of us think, uh, or, or we hear predominantly in the news or other sources, that um, the biggest threat to um, San Diego would be the San Andreas Fault. Um, yeah. Uh, keep in mind, the, the San Andreas Fault is about 121 miles east of us. Uh, we have a fault line that is for not even four miles, about two to three miles off our coast. There's a fault line that goes underneath Coronado and it goes all the way up on the west coast up to Newport Inglewood. Uh, it's called the Rose Canyon Fault and it's right off of our coastline. Okay, um, they just discovered um, in 2000 and I want to say 17 or 18 mm -hmm. that previously they thought the Rose Canyon Fault and the Newport Inglewood um, fault lines were two separate fault lines. Well, they've recently discovered that that's not the case. Um, those fault lines are actually joined together. So it's one fault line that goes up the coast of um, California up to Rosewood, Inglewood. Um, that is one of our biggest threats. Um, not to cause any panic, where they're saying within the next 20 odd years or so um, that there may be an event that happens from um, all the research that they've done. Um, so that's another reason why we need to be prepared um, for these type of events. We live in earthquake territory. Uh, and so when you combine that with the fires now and you combine and now you have earthquakes, again, um, 
part of my responsibility and, and Sharon's responsibility is to try to prepare our staff um, for, for these events. And, and you know, one of the reasons I think this is so interesting and, and helpful for people to know about is not just for all the reasons, all the correct and, and very valid reasons you just stated, but you know, I, I am a transplant from the East Coast and you know, obviously I know that earthquakes out here are a risk, but I remember reading a statistic that I think it was at least 50% of the people who live in San Diego have lived here for less than five years. And the reason I mention that is because uh, while anyone who knows anything about California has some general understanding that earthquakes are a risk, um, it's really helpful and great for people, especially if you're not, uh, if you weren't born and raised here, to really understand what you're sharing and understand uh, that uh, um, we are so close to fault lines and, and that there are multiple fault lines in the, in the um, state that we need to be considering and one in particular that's really close. Um, so, you know, you just taught me something I've, I've known about uh, the Rose Canyon Fault. I didn't appreciate how close it was. And you really hear, just like you said, a lot about the San Andreas Fault. So. Uh, I, I'm just putting my mind to all the people that are newer to the area, newer to San Diego, and how this information may not be as sort of ingrained into their subconscious the way that it probably should be for their own um, emergency preparedness. So uh, that's great information. Okay. Should um, I advance to the next slide? Yes, we can go to the next slide. All right. Okay, so uh, one of the things that um, Sharp does every year is we do what's called a, a HVA, which is a hazardous vulnerability uh, analysis. Well, what is that? We look at um, what, are the what, what are the circumstances that can cause us the most damage, um, so to speak. Um, so we'll take a list of um, 10 to 15 things. What's happened in, in the past? You know, what are we more vulnerable to, um, um, what is going to be the most vulnerable thing that we're going to have to face in the next year coming up based on what we've gone through in the past? So, you know, earthquakes, fires, um, each of our facilities has to fill out one of these reports. So Sharp Grossmont Hospital would fill out a report and they would look and we would look at the top five of those things. And that's what we're going to work on for the next year. Um, Sharp uh, Memorial would fill out the, uh, the, the the same thing and we would look at the top five things that they have and look at those things to work on um, during the next year well obviously now hba what are we going to have probably pandemic is probably going to be on the top of the list of things that we're going to have to work towards this next year um earthquakes like we just mentioned um fires um as always at the top of the list cyber um security is another thing that we have to look out and electricity um, when you're looking at uh, electrical, um, our favorite utility company um, for most of us, SDG and E, has rolling blackouts. Mm -hmm. Well, Sharp is not excluded from those rolling blackouts. And so you have to think about the clinics that we have, um, we're operating. We have to think about patients that are home who have medical care. When these blackouts happen, this is going to affect um, those um, structures. And, and those patients. And so we have to put plans into place um, to help with that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just share one more quick thing with you. Um, in particular, uh, when you look at an HBA and you would think, again, you know, if I, I say, what are the top five things that you would think would affect a certain hospital? Um, well, one of our facilities, um, one of the top five things that affects them, and it's, it is Sharp Grossmont, is assault um, on staff by patients. Now you wouldn't yeah. think of that probably off the top of your head, but because of the demographics of where the hospital is located and because of the patient population that goes there, you know, um, they're more susceptible to patient assaults than all the other facilities. So it's not just, um, again, it's not just mother nature, you know, it, it, it could be other things that you have to look at that you have to put into your assessment or your analysis and we want to work on these things to see what we can do to protect our staff 
that's wonderful information. I think it is really important too for us to keep reminding ourselves. I do think about emergencies and disasters in a very sort of um, uh, nature's will kind of way. And I do think it is important to move away from that mindset, especially based on everything you're sharing. Right. Um, what, what we do. So in disaster preparedness, we uh, manage South, um, Sharp Healthcare's emergency operations program. Uh, we monitor, regulation, monitor regulations and make certain we are compliant, facilitate exercises and drills for corporate command center hospitals and SRS um, to practice uh, plans and processes, identify areas for improvement, and become familiar with disaster related equipment. Um, why do we train? Why do we have the HVAs? Why do we identify that we um, need to work on these things and why do we need to practice? Because we want to be ready, not if a disaster happens, but when a disaster happens. Um, when do we activate disaster plans? When normal system hospital or clinic, uh, clinical, clinic operations are interrupted, when patient care may be affected, when an emergency incident is occurring in San Diego County. What is our focus? Keeping patients safe, mm -hmm. staff safe, protecting infrastructure, and business continuity. HICS. HICS is the Hospital Incident Command Center. <clears throat> so each hospital um, and uh, SRS clinics have a command center. Um, when there's an event that's triggered, um, what, we, what we do is activate each of our command centers. If something were to happen um, at Memorial uh, or in that area, the command center would be activated. If something happens at Grossmont, there was a, a command center that's activated. Right now, actually in the middle of this pandemic, I hope it's the middle, <laughs> um, but in this, <laughs> in, in this pandemic, um, all the command centers are either physically activated or virtually activated. There's somebody manning um, um, these centers all day long because of the, the nature of the event that we have going on. Um, hospitals and, and SRS communicate status and resource needs with corporate command center. And then the corporate command centers in turn will collaborate with the San Diego, with San Diego County. Um, so it goes from us, it goes to the county, it goes to the state, and then it would go to the federal government. And so right now we're in the midst of this and, and our corporate command centers are activated. You know, it's funny. I think that a, a year, a couple of years ago, I did not realize that we even had this infrastructure in place. And I think a lot of us have become very familiar with this model over the last couple of months. Um, kind of unfortunately in a way, because this is one of those things that you don't want to have to be using, but also very fortunate to understand that this uh, structure is in place and that SHARP has a really coordinated system for how it handles these kinds of um, emergency and disaster events. Um, before we move on to the next slide, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do a shameless plug because um, keep it, we also have um, NIMS Hicks training classes and anyone in a leadership position at Sharp Healthcare um, is required to take that class at least once while you're working at Sharp Healthcare. And um, you will be able to go on to SharpNet if you look up classes. We try to hold those classes uh, once a month. So if you want more information about the structure and um, how to work in the corporate command center, if you were to be in that position, um, I, I think that would be a very good class for you to take. So it's a class to learn like how, what your role could be in the command center and how you could become more familiar with it. Exactly. If you go to the next slide, actually, I, sure. I, let's see. Yes. So this is the hospital incident command system. Um, might be a little difficult to see, but it starts at the top with the incident commander and the incident commander is the one who would put together their team. You know, who do I need to help me through this situation? And we have finance, um, we have logistics, we have the planning, and we have operations. So those are the four um, disciplines that we have. And from there, um, the, the incident commander would decide, well, who's going to get activated? Who do I need right now um, to get me through this event? And underneath all those um, disciplines, there's, there's literally, you know, hundreds of people um, that work in, in, in the different capacities to get all this together. 
let's just say, for instance, um, COVID-19, we actually went live on January the 9th. Well, this is an event that's been happening every single day since January the 9th. So um, finances, all the equipment that we've used for this incident, um, when you get to the federal level and um, entities are getting patients that are COVID patients, well, there's reimbursement that you need to look at. Um, so our finance department has to get all these numbers together. Um, logistics, how do we get equipment from one place to the other place? Do we need to go to another hospital to borrow equipment? Respirators, right? We've heard that before in the news. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how do we get respirators? Who can we get them from if we can't get them from, say, the, uh, the federal government? Can we talk to other hospitals? So all these um, things are in place now um, so that we can um, work together, you know, and, 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 and try to get through this, this, this event. Um, communications. Um, what kind of communications do we have in a disaster? Well, most of us now have cell phones. Uh, we have satellite phones in, um, most, in almost all the facilities have them somewhere um, in there. Um, I've already been through cell phones, telephones, radios, um, web EOC. Um, for those that don't know, web EOC um, is the Emergency Operations Center, uh, which is out in San Diego County. And there's a, a certain group of us here that have access to that website. And what it does is it tells you, um, excuse me, I'm gonna cough here. <clears throat> it tells you all the events <laughs> that are going on um, for a particular uh, um, um, disaster. And, and if you wanted to um, get supplies from the county, you could go onto that website and you could order your supplies. Or if you wanted to request equipment from another hospital, um, you could do that. And it's internal as well as external. So if Sharp, Grossmont wanted to get something from Sharp Memorial, they could go on the website and then others could see it and then you could um, take care of it that way. We also have um, Sharp Communications. Um, most of us are on our emails, Outlook. You get the, the, the emails that come through uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, right. well, that's communication. And then we have an employee link. Um, you can call that number and um, in events that are going on, and it'll give you up-to-date information about what's going on. And we also have our emergency uh, notification system, ENS, which um, if you have um, your phones and everything set up, um, Sharp will send you um, out a message and let you know um, if something's going on in a particular facility or area. So, Joe, can you walk us through, or will you walk us through at a later slide, a little bit of how a person at Sharp Healthcare could get set up it so that they get those emergency notifications? Um, yes. I will, I, yes, I actually have this, coming uh, up? a slide that will come up, and I'll show you the link where you can get that information. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, so after a, uh, an event is over with, at some point, um, we're going to have to go into the recovery phase you know, and get back to the air quotes, normal. Um, and then develop uh, backup plans for um, the current process, which is business continuity. Um, so we go through and see, for instance, if um, all the electronics go down mm -hmm. okay, and people want to get paid, well, you're still going to want to check. And if we can't do it electronically, what's the backup plan to get you paid? So we put business continuity plans in, in in process. Wow. I think the more and more you talk, the more everyone can appreciate the scope of everything that you have to consider when you think about emergency preparedness. It's really incredible. It, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you, when, you, when you start breaking it down, it, 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 it's quite a lot. bit. Yeah. Um, you, your responsibility uh, as an employee, uh, as an employee uh, what can you do to, to, to help um, with the communications and what is your responsibility as far as where it goes. Uh, we would like you to share your contact information with your supervisor. Um, your supervisors, um, there might come a time where they're going to need to get in contact with you, even if it's off hours. It shouldn't be just working hours that they'll be able to get in contact. With. Update your contact information in Lawson. Um, and, it's, and you see there, Lawson forward slash disaster forward slash sharp ENS. And I have one slide that, that I'll point that out to you. And attend the disaster education presentations. Um, 
we know that there's a, a, a lot of emails that go out. People get email overload. I get it. I understand, you know, but we also need to take the time to educate ourselves about the things that are going on because we might find ourselves in a position that we're going to have to be the person in the corporate command center yeah. taking over that job. Um, you can't, one person can't be in there 24 hours a day, every single day. And so if you're in a position of leadership, there is a chance um, that you might be called to action, so to speak. And, and so um, when possible, at least make an, a, a, a conscious effort um, to make it to these classes and, and get the information, or at least know where to go to get the information if something happens. So Joe, remind everyone again where the disaster education pre presentation information exists. Where, are pe where do people go to learn about the classes? You can go on to um, SharpNet under, under, under disaster pre preparedness. Okay. <clears throat> That's one of the places you can go. And, I'll, and, and when, when we get there, I'll show you where the ENS is. But Sharp82 is where you go for classes. Okay. Um, you can go to Sharp82, click on the links there. Um, there's a list of all the classes that are currently um, up and ready to go. Um, right now, um, I'm in the process of adding more classes, but there is a, a, a NIMS and Hicks class, for instance, that's scheduled for the last Wednesday of every month or Thursday, depending did, on those things. Did you well, say, say that class name again? NIMS and what was it? And that was going back to NIMS and Hicks. That was the oh. uh, National Incident Ma uh, Management System and the Hospital Incident Command System. Those classes are once a month, usually the last Wednesday of every month. And they're virtual now. Almost every class at Sharp now is virtual. Yes. And so, but 82 Sharp is the place that you would go, on, go into and look at the classes that are available. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, and by the way, Nims and Hicks, um, you will get a certificate of completion when you finish the course. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for mentioning that. You're welcome. Um, so this would be SharpNet. This is our disaster page. And you can see that it's um, set up for staff to get um, as much information as we can give out to you and not have to go to 100 different places to find it. Um, so if, if you look at the top of it, it says SharpNet um, Caregiver Wellness Resources. You know, you got to take care of yourself. You know, if you're a caregiver, we're going through these times, people working 16 hour days, they're in and out of pappers. You know, we've got um, COVID is running rampant. We've got an earthquake potentially, we've got fires potentially. You got your family to take care of. You got homeschooling, all these things um, that are going on in people's lives right now. You can't come to work and do your job unless you take care of yourselves. Yeah. So there are resources that we put out here for you um, to go and, and get whatever it is that you could you need to continue doing your job. You know, um, SharePoint COVID-19 HID, those of you that are familiar with SharePoint. Um, SharePoint is now um, one of our communication tools that we're moving more towards. Um, if you were to click on that link uh, under SharpNet, and again, I'm sorry, this is under the disaster preparedness page. You just um, go to SharpNet, put in disaster preparedness. This is the page that you're gonna see. Yeah. Um, SharePoint COVID-19 HID, you click on there, it'll take you to the SharePoint page. It will tell you up to date since January, almost all things HID, staff information, uh, masking, um, what comes out from the state, um, um, California Health Alert, Alert Networks. I put all those documents on there. Um, I update this page pretty much every single day. Um, so we try to be consistent. You, you'll have information from the CDC. You'll have information from WHO, the World Health Organization. Um, the sharp communication that comes down from um, the HID team um, when they make um, <clears throat> the, the different recommendations of what we're going to do as far as sterilization. Um, that information that we can pass on to the staff is out there for you to see. Um, I, I highly recommend that you, 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 you go in there. Um, we also put on there, um, you have any questions, Megan, right now? No, I was just going to comment on 
just reinforce how much what you have posted around COVID and how frequently this has been updated, how meaningful that has been to so many people and how, yeah, truly timely and helpful and kind of reassuring and comforting it is to know that these updates are coming in as quickly as they are available. And there's a lot to say about the transparency that all parties involved have, have demonstrated by keeping this information as, as um, on the forefront as possible. So yeah, I just can't, I can't say enough uh, as someone who's been following a lot of this information in detail about how useful and meaningful that's been. You're, you're welcome. I'm, and I, I enjoy uh, doing this for the staff. I really do because I want them to be as informed as, as they possibly can. I think that helps bring down the stress levels a little bit. Yeah. And understand that we are putting out as much information as we can for you. Absolutely. Um, EOPs, emergency operation plans. Um, each facility has a plan for basically everything. You know, if, if a water pipe busts, there's a plan for that. <laughs> if there's an earthquake, there's a plan for that. If there's a smoke um, emergency, there's a plan for that. Um, it, it's, it's very vast. You can go in there and look. I would recommend that if you work at a certain facility, go into your facility's EOPs and take a look at them. What is the plan for the place that you work in? Or if nothing else, at least you'll know where to go get that information. If something um, were to happen and you had any questions and nobody's answering them for you, you yeah. now know you can go to the disaster page and, and, and go, hey, look, I can go right here and look. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see um, coronavirus COVID-19 updates from Sharp Healthcare, uh, and that's a different team that updates that information. Mm -hmm. um, the emergency communication systems, um, emergency preparedness contacts, okay? Um, everyone should go in there and update their contact information. Um, that will help with the ENS. Um, Sharp Emergency Notification System Disaster Page. That's a quick link. Um, go in there, click on that. That'll give you the information that you need about how do you get yourself activated in the ENS system. Um, and further down, um, we also have um, those HICS um, forms. Um, if you were to go into the Corporate Command Center and you needed to fill out um, certain um, documents or forms, um, they're here on the disaster page for you to print out and look at, and you can do those and get yourself familiar with those things. And we also do training. So um, everything that we can possibly put out there for you to, to, to educate yourselves and to also see what we're doing, um, you can pretty much find on the disaster page. Amazing. <laughs> That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. And again, people get here simply by going to disaster preparedness under SharpNet and then they land here. Yes. Great. Thank and you. if you have any questions, of course, if you're on the page, um, you run into something, you have any questions and just shoot me an email. You know, my contact information is on there also or shoot Sharon an email and, and her contact is information on there. And we're more than happy um, to, give, to give you any information that you need. Oh, thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. Um, so there's certain um, um, applications that you can uh, download to your phone or upload to your phone um, that I believe will be um, um, helpful to you. Um, one is called EOP, My Emergency Operation Procedures. And this is um, more for yourself to be prepared. And those same EOPs that I just showed you on the um, disaster preparedness page, you can upload those to your phone. You can have them ready for you so they're there with you all the time. You know, what's going on? Um, be prepared at home. It'll give you suggestions on how to get things together at home. Um, working with your family, uh, I think is a big thing. We have a tendency to assume that everybody knows what to do. Um, but have you really sat down with your family and discussed what it is that you, you, you're going to do when an event happens? Um, it'll also give you a step-by-step -step instruction on what to do, and then you can put, you can share that app with each of your family members. Um, I, I think it's very a useful tool. Um, the steps are, are to download it are there for you. You know, I, I wonder. Um, I have this app myself, but this detail is escaping me. Is there anything discussed around what to do regarding pets? Because you mentioned the fact that um, people often 
make assumptions about how their family might perceive, you know, appropriate responses when it comes to an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people also forget to plan for animals. And I've heard coming from someone from the East Coast where, you know, I was in kind of the hurricane um, zone. There were many, many stories of people not evacuating even when they were told to because they didn't want to abandon their animals. Um, is there information under the app around a um, pet? And, you know, if, if not, uh, do you have any kind of recommendations or sort of? Yeah, this particular one. On that? This particular app, I, I don't believe this one has information about pets. But the next one, let me go to the next slide. You got it. That was just my that's smooth a good, way that's a good of segue. <laughs> that's awesome. That's an awesome segue. I do know that San Diego County has information about pets. And right. this is another app that you can download. Um, the, the website is at the top of the page. This is an app that you can put on, on, on your phone. This is not Sharp related. The other app was Sharp related, which is why I don't think it has the, the pet um, information on there. But I'm 99% sure that the, um, the San Diego County um, um, app has um, information on what to do with, 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 with your pets. Um, you know, you should have a cage at home. You should have food for them, a store to start, the same you, you, you would as for yourself and, and your children. Um, this one is another app. Again, it goes through all the different scenarios. Um, what do you do if there's a flood? What if you do there's a chemical issue? What do you do if there's a fire? Um, how to prepare yourselves um, as a family. You know, you yourself could um, put together um, a list of things that you would like your family to do, and then you could share that up with your share that app with your family, and those things would be done. Um, so um, this is an, an, another excellent um, app to have on your on your yeah. cell phones, and make sure uh, I would urge you to to make sure you sell, share them with your children. Okay, it's the easiest thing that you can do is to get them to go onto an app and have it there for them. You know, yeah, they're really resistant to apps. They're, they'll probably follow along with this one. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, and I will say this is another app that I have downloaded myself uh, um, at the urging of Sharon, I believe, uh, and uh, thanks to Sharon. Um, and, and I've been glad that I've, I've had it. It's been very valuable and, and a good resource for information and um, obviously alerts too over the last year or so. So um, yeah, this is a, I can personally test this is a really good um, app to have on your phone. Um, at home, your personal disaster plan. Develop and practice the plan with your family. Can't stress it enough. Um, it, it, if you're looking at the news today, <laughs> and you're looking at how many families have been displaced, um, I, I think it's hard pressed not to put together a plan at this point. Yeah. Um, these fires right now are, they people can see them from LA. Yeah. The air quality has, uh, we can see the air quality in San Diego. Um, so it's not past the realm of possibility uh, that they, that it's a possibility that they can come down this way. Um, what better time to prepare yourselves and, and talk to your family? Um, right now, um, the other factor that we have, A, again, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So you have half of the kids that are, are in school and half of the kids are at home. Right. That's right. two different plans. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I never thought about that. You're absolutely right. You know, what are you going to do for your kids if they're at home? What are you going to do if your kids are in school? Yeah. Um, so you have to take those things in. Um, know your, about your utilities. Where is your gas shutoff? Okay. It's probably one of the most important things that you need to know at your house. We live in an earthquake zone. If you get a rattle or a good shake, um, there's a possibility that you're going to get a gas pipe that's going to break. Okay. Probably need to know how to turn that off. Okay. And, and keep in mind, um, if you, you get a wrench, make sure it's a wrench that doesn't give off a spark, okay? Okay, yeah, that'll create a whole other emergency. Very important. Um, or it has to I, would, yeah. I, I would say buy a wrench and tie it to your gas um, shutoff valve. Keep it there at all times. Show yeah. your kids, especially if you have teenagers, you know, show your kids how to shut it off. You know, either one of two things. You're either gonna have to show them how to shut it off if something were to happen, or you need to enforce to the, for them, get out the house. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, 
um, it, it, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, secure, secure your glass and other breakable objects. Um, earthquakes have a tendency um, to set off projectiles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people don't understand that if you have um, a cabinet that has a lot of items in it, glasses, dishes, and things of that nature, uh, you get an earthquake. I mean, you're, you, even three, four magnitude earthquake, those things are going to fly all over the place. If you have large TVs, most of us now, well, I wouldn't say most of us, a, a, a good amount of us right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, probably have large TVs, you yeah. know, 45, 55, 65 inch TVs. Well, those TVs are very heavy. Yes. Right? If you have a child, uh, especially if you have a toddler, and one of those TVs tips over on top of that child, okay, that's going to be painful, to say the least. Okay, um, if you have a mantelpiece, for those of us that have fireplaces, okay, think about the fact that if all those things are not um, secure to the fireplace uh, on that mantle, they're going to fly off. And you know, you can do little things like get two-sided um, scotch tape. Um, you know, they, they make tape now that doesn't ruin, ruin um, wood and, and, and glass and things of that nature. You know, you get a little piece, you put it on the bottom, put it on top. Pictures that are on the wall, people um, uh, still use nails. Well, again, they have two-sided tape you can use now. You can get away from the nails, which nails are just going to fly them around. You can get two-sided tape that goes easily on and off wallpaper and use those things. Oh, Joe, I never thought about hanging images or pictures on a wall and how that might become a danger when it comes to the nails and the hooks that I use to get them in there. That's a really um, good piece of information. And so thank you for sharing that one. Uh, the, the, the glass is falling, I, I've heard about before, but thinking about what could be on your walls that might be projected across the room and particularly small sharp objects like nails is something that I think a lot of us don't think about. So that's really good information to have. Yeah, and, um, and remember in an earthquake, what are we gonna do? We're gonna duck, we're gonna cover, and we're gonna hold on, yes. okay? Uh, don't run outside, all right? Don't stand in the doorway. Those are, those are myths that have been debunked at this point. You wanna get underneath something, you wanna hold on, and you wanna stay there. Okay. Um, there's a, a, a good, another good YouTube video of an earthquake that happened in um, Japan where they show individuals running out of an office building and um, you, you see bricks coming down, you see glass coming down, you know? So um, your, 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 your best bet is to, to, to hit the floor. The other thing is when, when a building starts shaking, you're gonna lose your balance. You're not gonna be yeah. able to run. You're, not, you're barely gonna be able to walk. Uh, so running is probably out of the question. So get down, get underneath something and hold on. Um, Great advice, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Um, disaster supplies. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Okay, you got it. Um, so disaster supplies. Get, en get enough supplies to last you at least three days. Now, from what we're learning, three days is, 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 is um, the minimal that you should do. Because what they have recently discovered, again, as we go on and we get to these events and we see these things that are happening, um, it's probably going to take more than three days for if we were to have a major event, um, a catastrophe. Yeah. Um, it's probably highly likely that it's going to take more than three days um, for emergency services to get to you. Yeah. You know, if, if your highways are, 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 are down and out, if your, um, your street is impassable, you know, if, if you can't get in and out of those areas, it's probably going to take more than three days. So um, put together something that you're gonna be able to sustain yourself. And when you put together something for three days, um, it's not three days for the whole family. It's three days for you. And then it's three days for your significant other. And then it's three days for your child. And then it's three days for your pet. Everybody is going to need their three days worth of whatever it is that you think is gonna be sustainable. Because if you ask your kids to put together something for three days, <laughs> it's not gonna be the same. It'd be like M&M's, my exactly. Xbox, my right. phone. <laughs> exactly, right? And the other thing though is listen to your kids because yeah. um, maybe someone wants to put their Game Boy 
in, in, in uh, for three days. Well, is anything really wrong with that? If you if you find yourself in a shelter, if you find yourself displaced, or if you find yourself disconnected, maybe they need that distraction. Yeah. You know, maybe that favorite toy, maybe a coloring book, or some activity to keep them busy. Um, if they end up going someplace that they're you know they're not used to being, they might end up in a shelter. You can't assume that. Okay, we, we said we're going to meet at grandma's house, who happens to live over here. Well, you got to get to grandma's house first, right? So, so it's kind of, it's kind of meeting all the bare minimum requirements around, uh, you know, um, protecting yourself and sustaining yourself. And then thinking about, okay, what, if anything, are the things that would help me um, mentally manage this moment as well? And by me, I mean myself and my children. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And, and, and I, I, um, again, I urge you to, to, to uh, just look at the events that are going on right now and listen to what people are saying. You know, um, maybe you keep your 72 hour bag in your car. Yeah. You know, or you keep one. Uh, again, your significant other keeps one. Maybe you, if you have um, more than one child, maybe um, you keep one bag for one of the children and um, your significant other keeps a bag for another one of the children. But you know, most people don't use up their whole car trunk, right? You just right. use go shopping and all these other things. So um, there's a high probability that there is space there that you can use. Yeah. Um, these uh, 72 hour bags, you can get creative with them. Um, for instance, one of the things I've told people is um, <clears throat> go to Home Depot or go to Lowe's, you know, and buy one of the five gallon buckets, right? The yeah. orange, big orange one you see or the big blue one you see. Oh, Take yeah. that home and how much stuff can you put in there that's going to last you for three days? And you can do it yourselves. You don't have to um, buy one that's already made. You can tailor it for yourselves. You can go to um, a store and get um, band-aids if you need to get some band medical equipment, um, blood pressure, make sure you have your medicines. It's, it's a, you know, um, set aside a week's worth of medicine maybe. And I'll we'll probably talk about that a little later on. Um, uh, if you if you have asthma, if you have high blood pressure, well, you want to make sure that you have a backup plan for if you're not able to get your meds. Um, yep. uh, uh, these things you need to think about ahead of time, um, because if you look at some of the neighborhoods that are um, having these issues, people have about five minutes, maybe 10, to run into the house, get what they can, and get out. So if you don't have these things ready to go, you know, you're going to find yourself running around because you're, you're going to be in a panic mode. You're, you know, yeah. you're, you're not going to be ready for it. And then that's how people end up forgetting things. And then when um, you, you, you see these stories and people, I left the house, I don't have anything. I've left everything that they have has been left in their house. So um, it's something to think about ahead of time. And is there a good place to go to? I feel like this is a great illustration what's on the screen right now of what people might want to consider. But, you know, I myself respond really well when I get sort of a, a list or a guide for, you know, packing for a certain way. Um, is there a good sort of catch all list that exists out there? Or is it just a good idea to Google, you know, um, emergency go bag to see what most people would include in those? Because sometimes it's really hard to think about what are all the things that you would need. Um, without having sort of a list or a guideline to react to. Yeah, this is, there, there are specific sites that you go to. You can go to the Red Cross. The Red Cross is a Red really Cross. good res, uh, resource um, that would have that kind of information. Um, you can pretty much type in go bag now in your search um, 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 browser and, uh -huh. and all types of things that will come up. You can buy ready-made bags at um, some of the commerce um, stores, um, Amazon um, has a, a ton of um, things that you can get, um, but you also got those. Those are generic, right? For for instance, they're going to say, okay, this is five days worth of stuff for XXX. That's great, mm -hmm. but if you have people in your family that have have specific needs, then you have to be mindful of um, what it is that you're purchasing, and is it going to be helpful? Um, if you look at um, myself, uh, I'll use DMAT as an example. Um, okay. I have a ready bag. Well, my ready bag is two weeks worth of supplies. Because um, if I, when I'm on call, 
um, I can go within a 24 hour period of time. Okay. Wow. So my, ready, yeah. my ready bag has um, clothes, you know, I have socks, I have underwear, I have an extra pair of sneakers, I have um, shower shoes, um, batteries, flashlights, um, whatever's going to get me through the next two weeks without having to go and purchase anything. Got yeah, it. That's, yeah. So that's how I would look at it. Um, 72 hour bag is great, but if you have a, a two week bag, you know, again, don't, don't, and keep in mind, never pack more than you can carry. Yes. If, if, great if, point. Yeah. If, yeah. If you can't carry it, don't, you know, don't, don't bother. You need something that you can just pick up, get out the door and, and be on your way. It's like, well, this, this, uh, huge uh, suitcase full of you know ready-made meals is great but i can't actually lug it to, out to my car exactly. so it ends up being completely useless so yeah that's a really good point um i will say as someone who has done a lot of um backpacking you can fit a lot i've had to ship food in those five gallon bags you can fit a lot of supplies in there if you're creative with how you pack it yeah. so um for those who feel like 72 hours worth of stuff would be a lot, it, it is, but it's definitely possible to fit even more in there if you just to watch a couple of videos or, or, you know, look at what the Red Cross is recommending as a starting point. Um, you may surprise yourself with how, how efficient you can be with space if you just sort of think through it a little bit more. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you for all that information. I've always thought the um, go bag was a really important element when it comes to emergency preparedness. So um, it's, it's great to get some recommendations around this. All right, you're welcome. Um, this slide, apps. Okay, so there's another thing. There's, 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 there's tons of apps out there that you can use in emergency preparedness. These are some of the ones that I've personally used myself um, because of, for various reasons. You know, and uh, they're recommended, you know, um, even if you don't use these, I would recommend that you have some sort of uh, emergency apps um, on your phone. Um, here's an idea that, that I use. Um, I never turn in my, my old cell phone. It, my old cell phone, for instance, is paid for. So um, the, the reason why I don't, uh, one of the reasons why, A, it's a backup phone. Mm -hmm. B, I can use it to download information and just keep it on the phone. So, um, for instance, the, the survival manual, there's an app for the Army survival manual. Well, I've downloaded that app onto my backup phone so I can read it and look at it and not use the power from my primary phone. Oh, that's, that, that's genius. We that all, a lot of us have an extra phone hanging around somewhere, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, you can still use those phones. You can use them as an alarm clock. Yeah. Oh. Um, you can use them for light. They have a flashlight on them. You, you can use them for upload um, files and, and reading materials. So they can come in handy if you put them to use. Um, SDG and E, my favorite utility company, um, their app is great. And you can set it up where, where it will tell you what areas are going to get rolling blackouts and or if your neighborhood is affected. So um, I highly recommend that, that people get that. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single app on here. I will point out, um, and I'm not um, endorsing any of these apps. You're um, not a paid find them useful, right. Um, WhatsApp, um, I don't do Facebook. I'm not a social person. However, I will tell you that WhatsApp works almost every single place that we've been. Um, example, in Puerto Rico, no other app would work except WhatsApp. Wow. And so I will urge people to take a look at it. Also, whatever communication app that your child is using, you probably want to have that app too. And most- oh, Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, you don't think about it until you, you, you realize there, um, when the communications goes down, you know, not everything goes through. You're not always going to get your text messages. You're not always going to get your phone calls. Um, but it's, um, you increase the chances of getting that information if you're communicating with the person that has the same apps that you do. You know, yeah. so if your kids are on Snapchat, for instance, well, maybe you want to have Snapchat just to know that you can communicate um, um, with your children. Meet, um, meeting would, your kids where they are from a social 
perspective. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's Google Translate, there's Zillow. Um, um, one of the ones is Scanner Radio. Um, Scanner Radio, there's two versions. There's a free version, and I think the paid version is a dollar ninety nine. Uh, Scanner Radio will um, allow you to hear what the police talking about. So if there's a fire up in Julian and engine 99 is going to, to a particular area, well, you can hear that traffic. Right, right. You yeah. know? Um, so if, if you have to evacuate San Diego, um, you can listen to the radio, AM, Kobo, or, or one of those stations, or you can go directly to the police scanners and listen to what they're saying. Makes sense. Uh, that's a great recommendation. I, I have not um, heard of half of these. And yes. you've already case built for me for why I should. I, I've always been resistant to some of these, um, some of these more common, more popular social media platforms, but you're absolutely right. There's a real emergency value in having at least consistent uh, or, or having apps that are at least consistent with what your loved ones are using. Um, this is a great list. So, so thank you for, for putting this together for all of us. You're, you're welcome. Um, I'll just go over two more. Um, Zillow. Sure, please. Um, um, Zillow is um, um, what we use, what I've used when I've gone out in the field with my DMAT team. It, it, it's more, uh, it'll turn your phone, uh, we won't turn it into, but it, it'll give you a walkie-talkie capabilities. Um, so you can do press to talk. Again, that's great if you have kids. Um, maybe there's a lot of traffic that's going over. People are calling left and right. Well, you can just go in and, and call your kids in another method of um, communication. And then um, Twitter. Um, I'm not, again, I don't use Twitter, I don't tweet people and all this stuff, but there's a lot of information that you can get off of Twitter that is useful. Um, yeah. If you look at my list, I follow like the CDC, <laughs> uh, FEMA, you know, Poison Control Center. So it, it can't, you know, um, there's a lot of negativity to some of these things, but they have their benefits also. Um, so. Oh. And, and at least I, I am a, a little bit familiar with Twitter, and, and from what I understand too, you can decide how how much you want to, to, to see and how much you don't. Like you can kind of curate the information. Yes. So if you're just following SDG&E, FEMA, and the CDC, and like one or two others, that's all you have to contend with. You don't have to open yourself up to the whole exactly yeah. Twitter universe or whatever they call it. Yeah, and you, 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 can, you can remain private. You don't have yeah. to you know, get all that stuff in there um, and, and just keep it that way. So um, those are, these are some of the ones that, um, um, again, I, I recommend. Um, I, you don't have to download all of them, but just keep those things in mind. There's, there's, there's alternatives to what you um, just have on your phone. Great, great to understand. Uh, really, really good um, information sharing here. Thank you so much. Um, we already got that. <laughs> I think Sorry. this is the second to the last one. And so again, don't forget about your pets. Um, you need three days worth of food. Uh, your pets need three days worth of food. Um, have a, a, a portable cage or, or, you know, maybe one that you can, um, if you don't um, use it at the house, there's ones that fold up that you can keep somewhere. You can just grab it and, and, and throw it in the car. Um, just in case you end up, um, if, it, if, if circumstances have it, you end up in a shelter or some place where you would need to keep your pet that doesn't have um, um, the accommodations, you know, um, at least you will have something that you'll need. And again, uh, food. Um, I'm not sure how many shelters, you know, are prepared for uh, an influx of pets. So yeah. it's something that you might want to take into consideration. Your medications. Um, again, um, and you can go to your doctor, um, especially uh, during this period, and ask them, uh, could you give me an extra month um, of medication so I can keep them, you know, in case something happens? And you, and you can rotate those things out. Um, gas up your vehicle. Yeah. Okay. I, we recommend in disaster preparedness, do not park your car in your driveway with at least uh, with no less than half a tank of gas. Uh, reason being, um, preferably three quarters actually. 
uh, if something happens in the middle of the night, if you get called into work, okay, because of some um, circumstances that's happened, okay, A, wouldn't you want your vehicle to already have gas in it? If you park your car in, in your driveway and it's on E, an event happens, then that's the first thing that you're going to have to do is put gas in your car. Absolutely. Number two, if the electricity goes out, gas stations in California do not work. There's no backup. There's no backup generators for gas stations in California. Um, there's only two states um, that have the requirement um, to have backup generators for gas stations, and they are, can you guess? No, I can't. I would have thought that California would be one of them. Louisiana and Florida. As a Floridian, I feel like I should know that. And of course that makes sense. Now that you say that, because pow the power is always going out in the Southeast because of hurricanes and a whole list of other really fun um, <laughs> disasters yeah. for that are constantly happening, happening over there. Yeah, they're the only it, two things that are mandated. It sounds like a, like a, a, um, a, a, a progressive preparatory st uh, like a, a good, good planning ahead activity or action. And so that's why part of me thought, well, it feels like a California thing. That feels like something that we would do, but you know what, it, it, it makes it makes very good practical sense in, in those states in particular. Yeah, um, and, and they're actually, you know, it looks like they're heading for another hurricane right now. So at yeah. least keep a, a half a tank of gas in your car and keep cash on hand. Yep. Um, when the electricity goes out, ATM machines go out, gas stations go out, um most of the time now we go we, we go in stores we swipe our credit cards yep. that's electricity you know what happens when electricity goes out how are you going to be able to purchase items that you're going to need right so yeah um, maybe you need to keep cash on hand um it's a good idea um a lot uh, of this oh go ahead no 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 go ahead, go ahead. It's just gonna, I was just going to say, a lot of this really illustrates how dependent we are on things running a certain way and how we have sort of a uniform way in our, in our country and our lifestyle to really just be going down one track and not considering that the conveniences that we have aren't always going to be there for us. And the cash on hand is just a great example of that. I think that there's, um, I don't want to reach for a statistic now because I think I'll probably just be, it'll be too much like guessing, but uh, um, I, I have heard a lot of statistics that suggest that most people don't carry or have on hand cash. And so that's just another really practical thing that we could be doing um, that would, uh, in a pinch, really make a big difference. Absolutely. Um, as we as we wind this down, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, I, I've been to... Um, uh, Puerto Rico for Hurricane Maria. I've been to New York. I've been to Hurricane Harvey. I've been down to um, North Carolina. Um, every disaster that I've been to, there's not one disaster that I've been to that I haven't run into people that have not said, I wish I was more prepared. It, it's the number one, it's, it's one of the number one things that you hear whenever you go into these env environments. I wish I was more prepared. And so I can't emphasize to um, our employees that it's worth taking the time to do these things now mm -hmm. uh, rather than um, pay the price um, later on. Yeah. And so um, I, I encourage everyone to please uh, um, take a serious look at this, especially if you have kids, especially if you have um, extended family, um, um, living with you now. Um, a lot of people have extended families. You, um, you, you, some people live with their parents. You know, uh, all these things need to be taken in, into consideration. Um, so, there you go. <laughs> no, I I think it's I think it's so true, and um, I, I think it's just good to remind everybody that. The information here really reflects a lot of the information that uh, um, you, Joe, kindly and, and thoughtfully uh, put together and share on SharpNet. So when I go on through some of these webinars, sometimes as a, as a viewer, sometimes it feels um, it can feel overwhelming or feel like, wow, that was a lot of information. And I think it's just good to remind people that they can um, rewatch this, uh, share this with their families 
and um, also, though important, they revisit the disaster um, uh, subpage on SharpNet to get a lot of the information, be reminded of the calls to action that have been mentioned here. Um, this information is, is, to your point, so important. And, you know, we always talk about, um, it's kind of a cliche to say that young people think they're invincible, but I think that we do carry that over as adults and kind of have this, oh, this is never going to happen to me kind of thing. Yeah. And if 2020 should tell us anything, it's that nothing is off the table and we should be preparing, right? Yeah, that, exactly. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it, it's there. We need, we need to be ready. Yeah, need to be absolutely. Ready. Absolutely. So, you know, I know that um, uh, maybe to your point around wrapping up, um, a good thing to emphasize, uh, this isn't a live webinar, so it's not like we can kind of take questions during this time, but if people have questions, Joe, they can just reach out to you, right? Just by email or by phone? Absolutely. You can reach me at um, godfrey.cole at sharp.com. Um, yes, my name's Godfrey. Everybody calls me Joe. And you can uh, type Joe into the um, address when you're looking it up because that's how it comes up in, in Sharp. Um, you can get in contact with um, Sharon Carlson also. Um, the first slide at the, at the beginning of this uh, slideshow here has our contact information. Also, if you go into SharpNet, um, our contact information is there and you can give me a call. Um, I'll be happy to share any information that I have uh, about this presentation and or other things. If you want to know more about DMAT, if you want to know more about CalMAT, um, I'm a disaster junkie. I'm here for you and I want you and your family to be prepared. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and um, Joe, once again, I just want to thank you so, so much for sharing your energy and your enthusiasm and expertise with us. This was great information. Um, you know, I just a little inside baseball to those who are watching this. Joe shared with me this slide deck and, you know, I work closely with you. I work with Sharon and I, I kind of feel like, okay, I, I, I've, I feel like I have a good grasp on a lot of this stuff, but a lot of what you've shared um, in this discussion it has really um, been new information to me and really helpful and I, I'm really excited for people to have the opportunity to um, uh, participate in this webinar and go through it and I do want to encourage those who are watching this to you know share this with your family maybe watch it with your family um, because it's also the kind of information that maybe you need to go through more than one time too so if you've watched this once maybe it's worth doing again later with your loved ones um, but yeah, knowing Joe that that you're you are out there and Sharon is out there doing all the work to help keep us safe, help keep the system prepared, um, is a really important part of the Sharp experience, and we really appreciate you. And um, I, I yeah, I think that uh, you know, in closing, um, if you are watching this and you want to talk to Joe. Um, scroll back to the beginning, look for him in Outlook. Um, I can speak from personal experience. He is always excited to uh, talk through more details of this. And thank you everybody for watching this today and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for giving us this platform. Absolutely, Joe. Have a great day, everyone.